Hello, welcome everyone to this panel discussion. Today we'll be talking about the World, Bar World Bank's report, sorry, on future fuels for the maritime industry. We will have a presentation and then we will have a panel discussion. Please feel free to ask questions at any time during the video, uh, in the video comments, and we will try to answer them at the end of the, of the presentation. But first, let me introduce the panelists participating today. Uh, we have four panelists. I'm the, uh, I'm the, the, the first one to, to go. My name is Eduardo Perez Orue. I'm the founder of a Small LNG Shipping Consultants, a consultancy firm specialized in small LNG shipping. I have 30 years of experience in developing business in the marine, maritime industry in Spain, the Netherlands, Argentina, the US, and Singapore. Next, let me introduce you to Mark Evans, uh, which will be sharing the screen with me. Um, Mark uh, Evans from Perth, from, uh, from Perth in Australia. Mark has over 30, 20 years sorry, of international experience in senior roles within the energy, oil and gas, shipbuilding and defense industries. Most recently in the Asia Pacific region, he has been involved as a founding executive director of successful global consultancy with a focus on the energy advisory. Mark is passionate about a sustainable global energy transition and building a brighter future for those he works with, clients and associated industries. Welcome, Mark. Next, let me introduce you to Nick Bentley. Nick Bentley from Bear. Nick is a proactive co-founder and director engaging in the energy industry. A decar decarbonization and sustainability focused professional who champions identifying and unlocking the opportunities enabled by applying today's technology. Nick is a strong advocate of using Australia's geographic and expansive natural resource position to develop a sustainable pathway to decar decarbonization using LNG as a in, the, in the immediate transition fuel. Welcome, Nick. And finally, let me introduce you to Captain Walker. Walter, sorry. Uh, we have Walter Purio from RiceX and SGMF Asia Pacific. Captain Purio is a seasoned mari marine industry professional and a low carbon marine fuel advocate. He is the chairman of RiceX IO, a company specializing in building digitized workflow software solutions on top of its cloud based Diana platform, which uses blockchain, AI, IoT, and machine learning tools to make operations, including LNG bunkering available anywhere, anytime, and on any device. He's a founder and was the inaugural CEO, CEO of the LNG Marine Fuel Institute, is member of the SGMF APAC committee, and is the chair of governors of the Lewin Ocean Adventure Foundation. I hope I pronounced that uh, rightly. So Thank welcome you. also, Captain. Thank and um, with this presentation, let me take back the control of the of the room. And after this introduction, let me bring up all the panelists and the presentation that Mark has prepared. So let me bring back everybody to the screen. We are the four panelists. And let me include the, the presentation that Mark has prepared. But first, please remember that you can ask your questions at any time. Mark, the floor is yours. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Eduardo. Uh, as mentioned, we have a, a brief presentation before the discussion. And the purpose is to frame the position of the World Bank and provide more context around what we'll be discussing. So, starting off with the recent report that the, um, the World Bank issued on the role of LNG in the transition towards low and zero carbon shipping. So, what we've done here, we've just, there's some really key points in the executive summary we've taken out. In the exact wording that very important to emphasize um, during this presentation. So, the first one says large scale temporary role of LNG is unlikely due to the uncertain greenhouse gas benefits, additional capital expenditures, the risk of strand assets, and most importantly, the risk of technology lock in with a greenhouse gas emissions trajectory, which would be incompatible with the IMO's climate target. So, yeah, this is quite a solid statement. And then they also go on to say that there's uncertainties surrounding the greenhouse gas benefits of LNG and suggest that public policy support for LNG as a bunker field should be avoided. 
So the, these are very um, bold statements to the makers, and, and you know they shouldn't be taken with a pinch of salt. Now, if we look at this into a, a little bit more detail. Um, we do, in their report, we can see that, you know, mentioned as well, that the temporary use of LNG may potentially not provide any greenhouse gas benefits and could provide some disbenefits is, is one component. Um, they've also concluded, and this is very much aligned with the industry, is that the most prominent zero carbon bunker fuels in the long term are going to be ammonia and hydrogen. They've gone on to say as well that in terms of compatibility, LNG infrastructure is not um, compatible with ammonia and hydrogen fuels. And further to this, there's challenging economics of adopting LNG, primarily because you're going to take a two-stage conversion process. That is, you'll build LNG bunkering infrastructure and later on you'll be building and replacing that with hydrogen infrastructure. Therefore, that's going to cost more than 30% more than taking a one-stage approach. Um, they also go on to talk about short-lived um, asset utilisations, that is the earning potential of these assets, given a potential um, peak of demand around 2030 and demanding rapidly thereafter due to regulatory pressures. And also no guarantee that LNG price remain at the attractive price that is at a major discount to diesel at the moment. They do, however, go on to say there may be no circumstances where LNG as a transition fuel makes sense. So... Again, we hope all of you had a chance to read the World Bank report, but these are some of the key conclusions from that. And, and we want to really challenge, is this correct? So to provide some more context around the supporting role of LNG and sustainable marine fuels, a couple more slides here, just to provide some backbone to our discussion points moving forwards and a bit of a basis of what we're talking about. So if you look at today, what is the case for the low to zero carbon marine fuels? Well, first of all, beyond the marine industry, we've got global trends. We've got lots of um, commitments to net zero by 2050 and 50% greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. In terms of the shipping sector, this accounts for 80% of the total world trade and emits just under 3% of the world's CO2 emissions. And the current fuels also emit around 14% of sulphur oxide pollution. And these carbon intensive fossil fuels also emit damaging NOx and particulate matters. Now, to counteract this, the IMO has got some targets in place. Um, they're looking at, based on 2008 baselines, achieving a 40% CO2 reduction by 2030, 70% CO2 reduction by 2050, and 50% greenhouse gas emissions reduction by 2050. Now, to regulate these in 2023, they're going to start bringing in some indexes, some energy efficiency indexes for existing and new ships in their design and also in their operation as, as listed on this slide back here. And, and again, looking more as a, a macro element outside the industry, there's significant investor pressure to move away from hydrocarbons from outside the shipping industry. And the reality is now is time to act. Now, looking at a common industry opinion, in, and this is for LNG's role, it, it's, it's widely agreed, but not by everyone, LNG is the most viable option for the immediate application in the heavy tonnage shipping market. Now, better greener options are on the fast track outside this market, say for short distance ferry trips or um, coastal trade. And these may be in terms of battery and hydrogen for short term, you know, application in the short term. It's also well acknowledged that LNG alone will not meet targets post 2030 and 2040 and different additional measures need to be made and this holds an investment risk. Also, the risk we have here is should the IMO wish to change its um, goalposts in a few years' time. It's also widely acknowledged that one size doesn't fit all and the final fuel selection may be route specific. Um, and in line with the World Bank report, um, the most promising zero carbon fuels in the long term are ammonia and hydrogen. And obviously, as we've been alluding to, there's a lot of differing opinions here, um, you know, from the World Bank, DNV, ABS in many countries. I think I read something that America might, they were trying to try and push um, not net zero, but zero emission by 2050. 
So just just to delve a little bit more into these differing opinions, I mean, LNG's role to transition meals, so fuel. So, you know, we've got people saying for against LNG, why do you want to use LNG? You're going to lock in a carbon intensive fuel for longer. But, you know, on the flip side, we can say, well, there's potential for some of this infrastructure to be upgraded for ammonia in the future. And then you could go back and say against LNG, well, look, not really, it's a two-stage conversion. It's a higher investment. But when you look at for using LNG, you can say, well, if we invest in LNG now, if we're smart, we can invest in infrastructure, particularly storage or other things, which have cross-compatibilities for these fuels. And by acting now, we use gain for the competitive price of, of LNG, LNGs of fuel, which is a multiple benefit to investment into the greener fuels in the future. And against, you can also go, well, look, you know, with the regulations of the IMO coming in, you've got a potential high regret position post-2030. Well, it, studies have shown on the flip side for LNG again that ship design operating optimization plus LNG can meet the 2030 targets and beyond potentially still be viable at to around mid 2040s. There's also the opinion that green fuels will be available at scale in many, many locations in the next five to 10 years. Now, this, this is something that is, is yet to be proven to be something that can be achieved. So if you use LNG, we can start reducing emissions now using proven technology and there's no waiting. There's also strong advocacy on not using LNG, talking about methane slip. It's much more potentially um, potent than CO2 as a greenhouse gas. Um, but we, many studies have shown, so SGMF have recently published, that around 20 to 23% of greenhouse gas reduction from well to wake um, using uh, versus today's conventional fuels, and there's no SOPs and NOPs. In addition to this, the engine manufacturers are well on top of the future emissions of methane and how to manage that. And so are some of the LNG suppliers. And obviously this is something that LNG fuel buyers need to be aware of. Now, we just wanted to put this graph up here. This, what it shows you here, this green triangle shows you that we've got these mature and available at scale fuels. You've seen here the LNG, LPG, um, marine gas oil, all those sort of these traditional fuels here. Um, you know, these, these are available in many locations worldwide, although obviously LNG and LPG aren't widely adopted for um, marine fuels yet. If you look here, we've got fuels such as methanol, which is a, a great candidate for use as a marine fuel, for example. They're mature, but they're not really available at scale worldwide. I mean, they may be in some ports, but not as many as the others. And then we move down to the very promising hydrogen-based fuels down here, which they're under the development and they're still a way off being economically and wide scale availability to be used as a marine fuel. And what's also worth noting is we move down to the bottom left hand corner of the graph, we did increasing fuel tank size the same voyage. Now, whilst this might not be an issue for short duration um, ferry journeys or coastal freight journeys, it certainly is for vessels such as container vessels, which rely on space to generate revenue. So the question is, should we wait for a silver bullet? Um, and, and one thing that's been put forward in this potential vision for decarbonisation is, is really this a two-pronged approach. And the, the crux of the two-pronged approach is to act immediately, act now. That can be done through use of LNG and hybrid solutions, um, which will be in line with the IMO regulations for the next, you know, you know for a, a reasonable sort of 15 to 20 year asset life um, and provide an economic transition. Now, the benefit as well from that is that a lot of the money saved in, say, using the uh, diesel and other fuels like that can be put back into relentlessly developing zero emission fuels and building that in parallel for decarbonisation with smart, obviously if you've made smart investment in the LNG infrastructure, which allows drop in these greener fuels in the future, it'll be a much smoother, sustainable transition. This slide deck here is, is, a, is a very good slide deck. It's courtesy of the Clean Marine Fuel Institute. And what you'll see here is the, the gray area on the slide shows you what's the cost of business. What if we, we wait, say, to 2030 when potentially, if we believe industry, when uh, ammonia and hydrogen will be available um, economically at um, scale? Well, 
that period between now and then, we are emitting, um, you know, there's, there's an opportunity we're missing out on, an opportunity loss to reduce emissions through adoption of fuels such as LNG. And it put us ahead of the curve, basically. You know, it's not saying let's not adopt these zero emission fuels. We all want those to be adopted. We want to act now and sustainably moving forwards to the future. Now, something else that should be considered is the economic impact of a transition. It's brilliant to have these goals and aspirations, but you know, as part of a sustainable approach, we need to consider what you know what the economic economic impact is. Now, in terms of shipping, as you mentioned before, it's you know greater than eighty percent global trade is done by shipping. If you look in the graph in the top right hand corner, you see a, a, a bulk of this is with you know uh, bulk carriers, iron ore, etc. And oil tankers, container ships, and so forth going down on there. And again, just a reminder: only just under three percent of this are the world's CO two emissions. So, as we do a transition, whether it's aggressive or or whatever form it's in, we need to acknowledge the fact there will be an increase in fuel price, and there will be an increase in ship build cost and the associated infrastructure in bunkering. Now, these costs in general will be passed on to the client consumer. Now. Whilst for an individual voyage, they might not be that much. I do believe Maersk recently presented something that for a pair of trainers, this could account for around six cents price increase from a single voyage. And that, okay, that, that's fine. That's not very much. But what we do need to consider is some products, so such as cars, will have multiple shipping elements in their supply chain to production and final delivery. So there will be more of a knock on effect there. And so we're all going to have to reach into our pockets, no matter what transition it is. The trick will be to find a sustainable one, which is a balance of the economic and environmental. So leads us to a smart, sustainable transition, potentially using LNG. In that. And how can we act now to leverage the immediate environmental and economical gains in LNG and avoid a regret position post-2030? Well, as we've reinforced before, act immediately as the opportunity is diminishing. Also, only focus on the heavy tonnage market. It, it's well known through numerous publications that it it's not viable to use LNG in, in the small, short distance ships, and they're already well suited to the battery and hydrogen routes. Um, only source LNG with low weld tank greenhouse gas emissions, as in that needs to be regulated. Know what you're buying. Look at your scope three emissions, it's very important. Leverage existing infrastructure. And when we invest in new infrastructure, do so with cross-fuel compatibility in mind, i.e. tanks that can store ammonia. You know, let's let's give ammonia and hydrogen a springboard, a, a, a turbocharge to get going for using this. Also, we need to target locations for high shipping traffic. I mean, that, that's a given, but also potential um, large ammonia availability in the future. I mean, here in Australia, we have a lot of plans for um, large-scale ammonia export and and luckily, they seem to be centred around a number of our shipping corridors. Um, looking onto the chip building side, let's let's build ships with actually the, the thought has gone into the upgrades to LNG to ammonia and hydrogen, and it, this has been going on for a while. But then there's a there's a number of um, institutions and companies now offering this, and notations available by class, say for ammonia ready. Also, build energy more energy efficient ships. You know, this then allows the LNG fuel ships to meet the uh, IMO uh, index targets post 2030, 2040. And, you know, it's, it's, it's not just fuel which is going to reduce those emissions. There's a whole lot of other factors as well we need to think about. We also can't forget the wider thing of, of, a, of a green ports picture. I mean, the fuel that goes into that, into the hubs and spokes, all the infrastructure in the ports to be running off as green or renewable fuel as, as possible in improvement and environment in those areas. We also, obviously, something that's been going on, we're looking at, we need removal and reduction of port fees and incentives. Um, I mean, this is pushing on the fact that industry on its own won't achieve this, we'll need regulation as well. And a part of that would be more emission control areas. And naturally as well, industry-wide collaboration. So what we're pushing at here is parallel development of green solutions that can leverage element infrastructure and operating practices. and intervention of well-guided regulations for sustainable transition. So that concludes the framing presentation. I now hand back over to Eduardo 
um, to uh, initiate the panel discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. I had to unmute my my microphone. Um, I will unmute. Um, I will ask uh, Nick and Captain Walter to to unmute their their microphones too. And welcome to this um, panel discussion. Remember that you can ask any questions at any time. As uh, as you were able to see, we will be putting the um, uh, your comments um, on screen when we when we finish this uh, this discussion. But uh, the analysis that Mark did was uh, was a very good one, and it raises a lot of questions on 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 why the report was uh, brought up, what is the meaning of the report, and what are the consequences of it. So let me start asking. The first question to Captain Walter. Uh, Captain, is the World Bank correct? Should we invest in LNG um, and, and, and how? Well, I'm going to say yes. The World Bank is correct, but they're not correct yet. This is a very long dated solution that. I believe we all want to have happen. Look, if I was to canvas this audience that we're speaking to today, including this panel, I would say that 99% of us, probably all of us would say, I am a believer in renewable energy. I am a believer in things that have to be sustainable. We want a sustainable world. We want a sustainable life. Who wouldn't want that? We do want that. But there's a way to get there. And I think what we what we have to look at in our world as as in the shipping world is to ask ourselves and we have a great opportunity right now. To ask ourselves. A very fundamental question. Why are we doing what we're going to do and how are we going to do it? But to define a purpose for renewables and a transition fuel in the world of LNG. Now, the World Bank is known for what they do do, and they support causes, and, and, and they're a fantastic organization. But there are other, other organizations around the world that are much more specific to what we, um, uh, in, our, in, the, in the marine world, like, the, like SGMF or, or CLNG or, or CMFI, these kind of organizations that very much believe in, in, in working it, working toward these goals, but doing it in a measured way, in a in a sustainable way, engaging governments to be part of the solution, and I think that we have got a great opportunity as a shipping world to wrap ourselves in these in in this dialogue for LNG as a fuel in the. 5, 10, 15 year, 20 year time frame, and to Mark's point, build the infrastructure to support the renewables as they come online and we have a multi-fuel marine world. I think that's a great opportunity, but to, again, to wrap ourselves around what I think is a very exciting part of, 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 of industry that's exploding, and that's the world of digitization. So take digital, take AI, take blockchain, take all of these different solutions, you know, machine learning, um, you know, the, the, the edge computing and put them all together. We as a marine industry are so conservative, ultra conservative, because we've had to be. And how, because probably I would think because of the communication, of the, we have had lack of it as we're out to sea, people don't, you know, people can't talk back in the day when we first started, I first went to sea, you know, we, we use sextus as our, as our major form of, of navigation. It worked, but it's a little bit better now. So all of these kind of things, I think we should we should look at. How do we, as an industry, engage all these different technologies, including the hardware that we're talking about today for LNG to be used for the former the, the future renewables in this in this ocean space. So anyway, that's my belief. That to leave this opening statement is uncertainty, in my belief is the enemy of enterprise. And we are living in an incredibly uncertain world. We as a marine industry are uber ultra conservative anyway. 
So we fall right into that and say, okay, well, we're not going to make any decision because that'll be the right decision. Well, in this case, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would say that it is the wrong decision. And I believe the World Bank has it right, but they don't have it have it right for right now. Thank you, Walter. What do you think, Nick? You're mute, sorry. Good point, Eduardo, thank you. And then also couldn't hear my comment on Walter's uh, sextant either, so that's good. Um, so no, I would completely agree with Walter's sentiments there. Um, I think the difficult thing with the World Bank is that they've clearly done some incredibly detailed research. Uh, if you look back into the UMass papers um, and the actual the back end of the report, a lot of what they say has been um, is is very well ratified throughout um, academia and throughout industry. They agree with everything we're saying in terms of the benefits of LNG, but what they're really focused on. And I think if you pulled out one sentence from, from the report, was that the uncertainty surrounding LNG in terms of um, its greenhouse gas impact, um, and assert, essentially around the impact of methane slip um, on the engines, um, and then also accounting for scope one, two, and three emissions, uh, LNG doesn't come out on top as being a, a primary, very sustainable, fully sustainable cyclical uh, marine fuel. And therefore, they're saying we're not going to advocate to policymakers to, to support it. But I, I think that aspect of the report is where we're seeing some divergence in opinion and in, in that the alternative, the counterfactual argument that they have is that we should be fully investing in ammonia or hydrogen projects. And we'll get to that in the next couple of questions. Um, these fuels and these technologies, they're, they're just not readily available right now. And the timeline to their rollout is going to be, it's not going to be five or 10 years until they're readily available and available throughout the fleet. You're looking at a 20 year horizon and we need to bank the emissions that we can now using LNG and rolling that throughout our fleet. Thank you, Nick. Um, personally, I think that um, uh, the report makes a mistake. Is uh, uh, The mistake is uh, basically saying uh, don't do anything because there's something much better coming up. And I think that is always a, a bad idea. I mean, just uh, of course, there are always better technology, better, better solutions, better alternatives coming up. Maybe or maybe not. Um, I think LNG is a solution today. It's, uh, uh, it's a proven technology. We are living in an emergency crisis. I, I fully agree on that one. And it's not the final decision, but it's doing something in the right direction. I think that is uh, that doing something today and maybe doing something better in the future is, is something extremely important. And not doing anything and waiting for better things to come is always the lazy approach, like let's do things as we always done and hopefully things will get better on, on their own. That, that to me makes no sense. Um, what do you think, Mark? I, I, I agree with, with all of your points. I mean, I, I'm just thinking if I was a ship owner and looking to make, you know, serious investments and, and worried on capital returns in the future of my business, and, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd be very confused. I mean, if I was taking um, the report from the World Bank and Third Bates and the message would quite clearly be is that wait for the silver bullet um, unless you've got deep enough pockets to, to go out there and, and, and build for that silver bullet. Um, and I, I think that the ship owners need more reassurance that, LNG as a fuel isn't, isn't going to make, make it so that if you build one now, your ship has only got a useful life of 10 years. The key thing is that with the efficiencies in design, and there's so much work going on in this arena worldwide at the moment that's been very well published and documented and peer reviewed, is that there is a place to meet the targets using LNG up to 2045. And that was published by DNV and HHI recently, actually. Um, so, you know, there's the, the risk perspective of that is that it, it's, it's actually, I'd say it's the lower risk to build an LNG powered vessel now with some cross compatibility for fuels in the future than to wait for the, the silver bullet. I mean, I, I, I just, I'd hate to think 
how painful it is going to be for the shipping market and the industries that rely on it if we do wait for that silver bullet. And, you know, it's, that's, that's the lens I see it, it, it from. Um, I did notice in the report as well that they, they criticised the IMO indexes and they, they, in the body report they've got some, they've done a, a good job, um, not necessarily bring, it's been summarised correctly and, and with a fair lens, but they criticised the indexes saying that it's easy to meet the targets because you're not considering scope three emissions. But the reality is, as we mentioned earlier, if you look beyond what these companies have to report, publicly listed companies are having to report their scope three emissions, i.e., when they buy their fuel, what are the emissions in the process of, of attaining that fuel? So you're actually going to go and seek, if you can use LNG, so, you know, an LNG supplier who's provided a fuel with the least amount of fuel emissions in their supply chain. So I think there's there's drivers outside and beyond that, that manage that. And, you know, it's yes, it's, it's going to be very challenging going forwards and that we just need to act now. It's That's the bottom line. We cannot afford to wait. Yeah. Before we go to the next question, let me just bring up some of the questions uh, that the audience is is, is doing. Um, so we get, we can all participate and try to share uh, our opinions. Um, what is the effect of implementation of LNG um, for, uh, sorry, uh, the implementation of IMO for LNG users in marine in Southeast Asian region? Anyone wants to take that one? I think personally that uh, the implementation of the IM IMO regulations is being very sketchy because there's no reinforcement and that is not helping the industry as a whole and is not helping the environment, that's for sure. Um, not only in Southeast Asia, but all around the world. Um, I don't know how many fines have you seen uh, uh, as reported because of the lack of uh, compliance with the new IMO regulations, but I haven't seen any, to be honest. So I think that is a, an issue. Anybody else? You're mute. I, 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 I reflect, or oh, Walter can go first. No, no, sorry. I, yeah, I, I, I would say that I, I agree with you uh, completely, Eduardo, that, that it, has, it has been sketchy. But again, uh, this uncertainty that we're seeing, and it, compounded by the obvious effects of, of what we're dealing with around the world with COVID, that this is an, an element that is just, is just adding fuel to this fire. Of what of what what you're saying about the about the compliance issues, the message has to be clean, clear, and strong by local governments, by local industry, and by the global marine industry that this is what we're doing. Full stop. That's it. Simple. And the, to be able to to enforce it is a very very important uh, you know consideration. I mean, nobody wants to pay more than they have to pay for anything, but I, I, I still believe there's a bigger purpose here that we have to all, I, I guess, I guess mm -hmm. all come around and believe in. Mm -hmm. uh, Nick? No, I, I think again, Walter seems to echo my sen my sentiments. Um, and I, I would agree that it is, it really, at this stage, we can't rely on um, you can't rely on regulators or on countries to enforce these rules. It really needs to come from the the, the ship owners themselves and their their desire to adhere to what is recognised as the remainder of their peers. If the remainder of their peers um, at a certain other um, ship owner agency or charterer are aligned with certain regulations and they can prove this. You'll, you'll want to be doing the same thing and you'll be incentivized to do that. Being able to go on board with um, Coast Guard or Customs Boat and actually trying to test someone's fuel and then issue them a fine and ensure the fine is paid in the correct jurisdiction, the, the bureaucracy behind that is not something that we can actually rely on. So it needs to, it needs to come from stakeholders within the ownership companies and those who are actually responsible for buying the, the fuel and for running the fuel. Um, and those stakeholders can be shareholders, management, executive teams, all the way, all the way down the chain, and they they need to be aligned. So, it's, it's it is a cooperative effort, and that, to be honest, is really the benefit of the IMO 2020 regulations. They give people a common target. If you don't have the IMO 2020 regulations as a global target, then individual countries have different um, have different standards, and then people can say, oh, well, you know, these guys they're not doing it, so we won't be following in those in their footsteps. But a common global target for 2020, it's been a brilliant standpoint for the IMO. 
what we're going to see in 2030. Again, another increase in the regulations with a final aim in 2050. And I think that's something we'll get to a little bit later is do we feel that the IMO's targets in 2050 are actually aligned with the remainder of the world and other industries in the, a 50% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 in recent years actually looks almost um, almost a bit backwards and the a majority of industries are aiming for net zero by 2050. So is that something that we're going to be able to achieve? Um, and I might handle that to, to Mark um, to see what your influence is on that. Thanks, Nick, uh, Walter and Eduardo. Uh, in, in, in agreement there, look, I'd, Nick, um, your point about will the IMO move the goalposts based on pressure from outside the industry, and I think there's, there's a reasonable risk of that, um, but it all needs to be done with a sustainable viewpoint. And one thing that's worth mentioning in terms of the IMO 2020 sulphur cap is that we're working with clients who, who have major power generation using heavy fuel oil. And all they've been asked to do by the governing bodies in the country in the moment is show intent. That gives them a licence to drag their feet and delay investment for as long as possible. Um, the reason the governments aren't forcing these organisations is they're worried about the loss of revenue and income that they rely on from those companies. So this this is a major issue and it, you know, I don't know the answer to it, but um, it, the penalties need to be harsh and they need to be examples, otherwise this just won't happen. Okay, before I go to the next uh, question that we have prepared, I have one um, uh, one comment to make. Um, I had a list of questions that you are asking in LinkedIn that um, I had to reset my computer and they disappear. So sorry if we don't put some of the questions you ask already. Uh, these things happen. That is the problem with live events. Uh, the next question I have is from Andreas uh, and I will bring that up uh, a bit later, but uh, Sorry, but uh, I lost some of your questions. Uh, terribly sorry on that one. They will still be in LinkedIn, but uh, they will decide, they will not be. I will not be able to put them on the screen. So, but uh, let me continue with the next question. The, Nick, you wanted to say something. Uh, I was going to mention that we'll endeavour to answer all the questions after the fact uh, through the LinkedIn portal as, as best we can. So, offline, exactly. Perfect. Thank you very much. So the next question that we had prepared ourselves is, um, uh, can we increase uptake rate of green fuel such as ammonia through the use of LNG? And, um, and uh, let's see what you, you think about this. Uh, Walter, what do you think about this? I, I think we, we will increase the uptake of green fuels because LNG, is, as an example, is really the the pinnacle of, I guess, hydrocarbon fuels that we've worked through. You know, we had coal and we have oil, and now we've gotten to LNG in the marine space. But we're, we've, we are, we've run into, or we're working into a multi-fuel world for marine. And I think by working with this new solution of, of, of LNG, you're gonna find, well, I'm okay with ammonia. I'm okay with methanol. I'm okay with other types of fuels. Yeah, you know, I can actually run my I can run my generators on, on battery or, or, or wind or whatever. So I think we're going to find this as we go in the next, you know, 10, 20, 30 years. And I think that's actually very, very good. Now, I won't be surprised that, that, that if we have something in the in the future, in the near future, people are going to say, well, you know. The global sulfur, sulfur cap worked, worked pretty well. Yeah, there's, there's enforcement issues and there's this, that, and the other. But I won't be surprised if we have a carbon eco that actually, or CO2 eco, I should say, that, that, comes, on, that comes into play. And people say, well, maybe this is another way of enforcing this because we're having general, again, governments are going to have to come together and meet these requirements that they put on themselves. So I think, that, you know, keep a weather eye on that because I think that that could actually actually happen. But with the, the with using the newer technologies, Wrapping up newer technologies around LNG as a fuel, people will become comfortable. I will become comfortable. The industry will become comfortable with using these gases. And then it'll just be like, well, why not ammonia? Nick, what, what do you think? So there's, there's a key argument in the, uh, in the World Bank report um, against a uh, policy advocation for, for LNG. 
Um, and that's actually against going through two separate transitions, going through one transition to LNG, which requires, re requires a certain amount of investment, and then going into a secondary or even tertiary transition to ammonia and to hydrogen to actual zero, uh, to zero carbon or net zero carbon fuels. Um, so I, I completely understand that they're, they're looking at that from an economic standpoint. Um, but the same thing stands that from, from an availability and from a technological standpoint, we're not have, we don't have an ammonia option right now. So sort of, again, in light with Walter's comment, I really believe that we have the technology now. We actually, we have the distribution mechanisms now. We understand the, the, we understand LNG. We understand its form and its state and how to handle it. So we've got everything in place to roll this out immediately. And it is being rolled out as we see across the world with, I believe it's 30 or 40 um, dual fueled or LNG ready ships now on the order books. So it's starting to happen. Um, but from the point of, is it ready to, is it, is it paving the way for ammonia? The technology is not completely incompatible. There are small elements that you can use uh, together. They're not going to be perfectly efficient either way. But however, you can use um, certain tanks of LNG to support ammonia, then you'll need to reinforce them to encourage the additional density of ammonia that you'll be carrying. And there's some other uh, technological points that we need to consider as well. However, as was mentioned, the understanding of dealing with the gases, the operational procedures and on, they, they still need to be developed for ammonia, which we've already got for LNG. So will ammonia, will LNG provide a pathway? It will, it will help, but the main point is that will, it will help with the emissions bank that will, it will be able to cut by using LNG now rather than waiting for ammonia, which is going to be a 5, 10, 15 year process. I, I I have to agree with that one. I think that um, uh, that uh, it might be a way to to uh, prepare the path for 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 green ammonia, or maybe not. Um, actually, using LNG will will might create blue ammonia, what they define as uh, blue ammonia. Uh, so once you are in that way, are are you sure you're going to be able to change to to green ammonia? Maybe yes, maybe no. So uh, again, I think it's confusing the uh, the, the goal, which is re reducing the emissions um, uh, to the atmosphere. We are in an uh, emergency crisis. What alternatives do we have today? We have LNG. That's that's it. The the other might work fine. I mean, let's just start working on them, but let's start doing what we can today. Um, what do you think, Mark? Do you agree with the, with what we all said, or or you have a different opinion? Um, I mean. You've, there's been a bit of focus on the production of the uh, green fuels here. Um, my, my view is it's, it's, I'm just going to talk more about the, um, the bunkering infrastructure. And, and as mentioned in the presentation earlier, is that smart investment in infrastructure, key capital expenditure items, long lead items such as LNG tanks, which are compatible with fuels such as ammonia, are going to mean that we can accelerate that chain um, swap over such that once those fuels are available at scale and there's enough ships to support that demand, we're in a position to quickly upgrade that infrastructure or even have it start operating in parallel and taking over to provide bunkering facilities to um, to those ships. And to me, that is, it's really critical that if, if you're investing in a bunker vessel, for example, um, that can take LNG. It doesn't cost a, a lot more to have tanks. It's not a quantum more to have tanks that would potentially be potentially, uh, compatible with ammonia in the future, such that you know you, you're ready for that step when it comes. It, and it shows intent as well. Um, and and it'll, it 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 because you know it's the issue we've got with LNG. You're going to have ammonia in the future. Is the issue with LNG at the moment is getting investment into bunkering facilities because the market's quite small. But if you do that for a smart investment in bunkering facilities, you run off LNG now, you, suddenly you've got a volume, a density of infrastructure which reduce that capital investment to move across to ammonia, for example, um, uh, and allow a slow ramp up um, with, with less of that investment risk. To, to me, that, that that's actually absolutely fundamental. And, you know, and when we put our dollars on the table to invest in these assets, that we need to think about that future. And if we don't, um, I'm afraid the World Bank is 100% right and we should not invest in LNG. 
Okay, that is not the end I was expecting, but uh, but, <laughs> but it was a rhetorical question. Thank you for that one. Uh, before we continue to the third question, let me bring up some of the questions that people are asking. Um, Andreas is um, uh, very early morning for Andreas, so thank you very much for being here. So Andreas is asking that government is or commenting that governments are afraid to enforce the LNG uh, rule because they are afraid of being labeled labeled as anti-zero emissions. They are afraid that they, if they support LNG, they will. Uh, they are stuck in the past, so they remain silent until the proverbial, proverbial dust settles. Um, I have to say that, in a way, that is that is true. I mean, it's, um, everybody wants to look cool and, and proactive and, and looking at the at doing the best for the for the planet. And doing the best for the planet seems to be not doing anything. So, I, um, what do you think about this? Any any comments? Doing the best for the planet seems to be doing nothing. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, I think you're right. That's, that seems to be what the sentiment is. And I think it, again, pivots back to this issue of certainty. People are uncertain. Nobody wants to spend hundreds of millions of dollars in infrastructure if they don't know what the return is, to Mark's point, what's going to happen in the future. And keeping, I, I guess I would, I would rhetorically say, a pre-COVID frame on a post-COVID problem so how do we how do we bring those together? And look, a lot smarter minds than me are going to figure this out. But I, I, I just believe that that we have got a, a great way forward here. People are just going to have to governments are going to have to listen to their people, but also listen to their businesses that are employing those people to say, we we get it. We want this to happen, but it's not going to happen today. It's going to happen in the future. So to me, that kind of a dialogue and that kind of a, I guess, a, a, a program or a process to educate the world on what this can and can't be in the short, medium and long term is critically important to the success of not only LNG as a fuel, but also renewables to take their place. Nick? I was going to make the point that um, essentially, I mean, we're here based in Australia, but this is this is a global issue. Um, Australia has been very slow, to be honest, um, in uh, actually encouraging LNG as a marine fuel. There's there's a few um, re regulatory regulatory issues. Um, there's some domestic gas versus. Um, Broad gas sales issues as well, um, which has essentially limited our ability to actually build a bunkering industry here. And it wouldn't have been a difficult thing to have foresworn this industry 20 years ago or 15 years ago and to put the incentives in place. So I think this question is actually quite, it's it's very, very relevant question, but it really should have been asked 15 years ago, 20 years ago, which is what they did within the EU. And within the EU, they've been supporting sustainable sort of LNG initiatives for years now. And that's why you've got, to be honest, the hub of global LNG bunkering is, is in the EU. It's out of Rotterdam because it, it had been sustained from government initiatives. Now, Australia and Asia is slowly catching up, but we're st we are still honestly quite far behind. So um, in, in terms of enforcing the LNG rule or in terms of incentivizing the use of LNG, I fully believe they should be doing it, but actually, I really believe they should have been doing it years ago, as as per the EU. Um, and then I guess the sentiment would be, oh, well, is it now too late? Should they then make the jump and only now only now incentivize um, ammonia or hydrogen or or zero carbon fuels? And to be honest, I believe the answer is is both, and that's probably a bit of a cop out, but it's it is again the same messaging immediately right now incentivize the use of LNG as a bunker fuel. Use that for the next ship regeneration cycle, which will last 15 or 20 years. After that, or in the run-up to the next cycle, you can also be investing in and incentivizing the use of ammonia and, and hydrogen as, as a marine fuel in time, when they can be developed, when we have them available at scale and, to be honest, in an economical way. Um, and I noticed one question that was asked previously, um, which was, how do we account for a carbon credit type or carbon pricing type? Now, LNG at the moment is seen as the, I'm going to continue running on, but LNG at the moment is seen as the 
optimum in terms of sustainability and in terms of economy because it's actually an achievable um, fuel to use and we can put a price on it. Once we start rolling a carbon price into the equation, it's going to be completely skewed off and we probably will see fuels such as ammonia and hydrogen coming to the fore in those cases. Quicker, quicker. Sorry, I was mute. Mark, any comments from your side? Um, I, I just want to, all I want to add really is that it is up to forums like this and the people listening to to talk to their um, local governments and, and uh, high house representatives and educate them and, you know, and not make them cling to the buzzwords of renewable and, and green and hydrogen immediately, but say, a new and green hydrogen will definitely happen, but this is how we're going to get there quicker and sustainably. Now, we've been doing that along with uh, Walter here um, it, for quite a while in Australia, talking to um, the politicians and educating them. And it's it's a long journey. It, it's you know it's like a journey of a thousand miles. You have to start with your first step. It's going to take time, but you know it's it's one thing to win votes to say that we are going green immediately, but when the public sees it you can't demonstrate a pathway to do that then you, you need to backtrack and figure out how you're going to do it so again maybe a little bit of a controversial response but um we need to be realistic about how we're going to get there and look at the most sustainable quick way we can achieve this eduardo i'd like to add though to what what mark said and just say that the sgmf Put out a report on the life cycle of ghg emissions a study very recently interestingly the same week as the world as the world bank came out with their report now i know i'm singing to singing from the same sheet of music to most people in this audience but that study is something that we could use as an industry to educate our governments about what this actually is i am very happy in any business that I've ever been involved in to have a reduction in my costs of 20-25%. This is, a, I'm ecstatic that we could reduce our emissions quotient by 25% of, you know, of, of, you know, of, of carbon. And I, I think in any other world, that's a fantastic outcome. And it isn't being celebrated. And I think this is the message that we have to get across. This is a great thing. It will be even greater, but let's build the infrastructure to make it greater in the, you know, in the 2030s, 40s, 50s, and into the, in, past the century, into the century. Yeah. Very good, very good point. So le let me just bring up a few more questions because I, I think that is a, a great way to, to exchange information with the audience. Um, Greg Hector is, uh, is asking, is commenting that it could appear a carbon credit type approach that would give owners incentive to use alternative fuels uh, could be worth a worth a worthwhile consideration. Anyone has any comment on that one? Nobody. I'm Nick. Go, go ahead. I, I vaguely touched on it earlier, but. I think a, a, re a really good point here is, um, again, if you, if you dive into the report, the, the cost to decarbonize um, the world's shipping industry is going to be $2 trillion. So for full decarbonization with that sort of um, infrastructure cost, there's going to need to be some other incentives outside of um, purely monetary. And in order to collate, essentially, or to connect monetary with um, environmental impact, you do need this, essentially you need this carbon credit scheme to be applied. And um, the, the cost to run or to roll out the LNG infrastructure is only gonna be, I say only, but it's only gonna be $186 billion. So significantly less, um, less than 10% of what it's gonna cost to decarbonize. Now, the argument in the, in the report is that if you're going to decarbonize anyway, why spend that additional 10% to realize LNG? Um, but I think the unknown and the uncertainty factors around the renewable generation of fuel 
and the costs associated with those, that, that $2 trillion is a very, very loose number. It, it essentially has to be at this stage. We're looking forwards into the future, 25, 30 years, um, you really can't put that kind of accuracy on it. So I, I think the spending of $186 billion to roll out LNG across our fleet right now is a very worthwhile uh, investment. We have to realize that um, America, the USA, they managed to reduce their carbon emissions by 15% over the last 20 years. And that was because they transitioned from coal to natural gas not because of renewables, but because of that transition to natural gas. We can do the same with shipping, utilizing, again, utilizing the same technology and an abundant natural resource that we have. If we want to balance the equation earlier than um, having renewables on tap, readily available, you know, essentially too cheap to meter, use the phrase, um, then we are gonna need to incentivize it with some form of carbon credit. And that, that's probably a very key element in terms of government policy that will help accelerate this, this transition and will help accelerate us towards zero carbon fuels. Thank you. Captain, any comments on this? I, I would say that you would, you would look at that, Mark. I, I'm sorry, uh, Nick, I agree completely. Uh, but I, I, I wouldn't say it, that it would be one or the other. I look at this as a transition from different types of fuels through until we get to renewables, like you're talking about. I would love to see incentives, frankly, for even for for heavy fuel users to use to, to be able to make make very much you know like BLSFO, the incentive to bring it down to you know 0.1 percent sulfur. That's a great thing. I don't think that I don't think they shouldn't be they shouldn't be incentivized. I don't think I think that LNG should be incentivized. And then I also think that of course that the renewables should be incentivized to bring anything down from where we were to where we are, we need to be is a good thing. We'll get there. We'll get there in the end, but we have to Mark's point. You have to take that first step. You're muted. Sorry, muted again. Sorry about that. Mark, any comments on, on, on this one? Um, I mean, <laughs> The, the carbon credit will have an impact. Um, it, it's how long is a piece of string, how much, you know, how much impact it will have and what it will cost. Um, I, I think what will drive it more is the availability of the green fuels at scale. You, you can put all the carbon credits in the world and you want, but if we can't scale up the deployment of those fuels quick enough, it, you're just going to drive up the cost of shipping and go nowhere. So yeah. it, it's a, again, it's a, it's a bit of a grey area in, in my view, um, and it needs to be careful how it's applied such that um, I, it's a sustainable transition. I personally think that uh, it might be a problem just trying to enforce that one with ship owners um, all around the world with different flags and different um, uh, locations and with different countries uh, applying different rules. So. Uh, uh, it's one idea, but I, I think it would be extremely difficult to, to enforce. Um, uh, uh, let me speed up a little bit some of the questions because I think there are great comments and great questions in here. And um, I will ask you just to be brief and, and uh, um, to comment quickly on this one. Uh, Francisco Juarez makes a, a fantastic point. Uh, ammonia sounds uh, great, but we have to migrate to green and ammonia first in order to the solution to make sense. The report talks about green ammonia and green hydrogen. and um, Afterwards, the headlines refer only to ammonia and hydrogen. I mean, the report is talking about green ammonia and green hydrogen. Not any ammonia is valid for this one. So um, anyone who wants to make any comment on, on, on this? Mark, you go. It, I mean, we, the, the, the focus of this discussion has been more in the use of the, the type of fuel, not, not so much whether it's green ammonia or... Um, or whatever you can have turquoise ammonia or many different variants um you know which, which one and how quickly they will be developed um there's a there's a lot of ambitious projects around the world for highly scaled up hydrogen um, and production and green ammonia production um and we it'd be very interesting to see is, is you know when they will realistically come to market uh there's I mean, there's some wonderful statistics out there, which I believe Nick will touch on later in the next question a bit. 
the, what the cost and time scale there is going to be to get to these. And it, I think that whilst we all want green ammonia and green hydrogen, we have to accept there's probably a few steps in that using natural gas and, and some carbon capture and other aspects before we get to it, particularly if we want to scale up quickly. Mm -hmm. Nick, you wanted to say something also? Uh, I, I guess I'll, I'll follow on from Mark's point. Um, essentially, the, the difference between uh, green ammonia and ammonia produced from, from a hydrocarbon source or blue ammonia where your hydrocarbon is then sequestered, um, you pay you pay a, a green premium on that on that product. You, it's about three and a half or maybe three point two times what you will pay for um, the, the grey or the blue ammonia. Now, I think that the main issue of rolling out green ammonia for a world fleet is essentially going to be availability, and it's going to be the generation capacity of of hydrogen to turn into ammonia. Um, the IEA projects that there's going to be, um, I believe it's going to be eight gigawatts. I'll have to get a look at the facts. Eight gigawatts of um, hydrogen capacity by 2030, and that's already a massive increase in what we are projecting today, um, or what we actually have in terms of our capacity today. If you want to fuel five percent of the world's fleet with green ammonia, you need to increase that number thirty-fold. And it's, just, it's, an apt, it's, it's an astronomical amount of investment required to do that. You need 500,000 wind turbines, for instance, which essentially means you need to be building 50 wind turbines a day for the next decade. Um, and that's just something that's very, very difficult to achieve. I'm not, I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's just incredibly costly. So I think Francisco's point really is we need to initiate this industry not with green ammonia, but actually with grey and blue ammonia and then transition to green as the capacity generation catches up with the demand. Because at this point in time, on our, on our current trajectory and with all the will and all the investment in the world, we're not going to meet those kind of targets if we go fully green straight away. Mm -hmm. Captain, any comment on, on this one? Or we go to the question? To the, to the next question. Okay, let, let me just bring up the third question we have prepared. And uh, Captain, this uh, this time is uh, is for you. Will green fuels be able to scale by 2030? And Nick already mentioned something on this one. Uh, but uh, what is what is your comment on this one? I just I think it's how much money you want to throw at it and how much you get government behind it. Simply, do I think it'll be ready by 2030? No, I don't think it will be. I think there'll be other there'll be other things that come on that, that will that will continue to to feed the Ill issues of uncertainty, which will make our industries stay back on the back foot until we're certain, which will never happen. Tomorrow never comes. And I think that's a very important thing to remember as we move forward with this. So I would say no, we're not. We will get there, but we get there by twenty thirty. I don't think so. Yeah. Nick? Yeah. Well, I would just um, re-clarify my statement earlier when I said eight gigawatts, it was actually eight million tons a year of hydrogen. Too many figures flying around in my head. Um, so there's eight million tons a year of hydrogen capacity by 2030 currently predicted, and uh, and we need 60. So that, yeah, that's the 30-fold increase. So will green fuels be available at scale by 2030? Um, yes, they're going to be available. Um, at scale is, uh, that's hard to define but to say it's readily available and able to be rolled out across the world fleet um no and i think even five percent will be quite difficult now lng for instance it's been around for 20 years and it is only now starting to make even a tiny dent in the world fleet because ship, ships have a, a 20 or 25 year life cycle you only replace your ships as they as they reach the end or once they become uncompetitive. You're not going to replace them just because a new technology comes up. There's always going to be an incentive to keep your older ship going for a while. So it is a very slow to regenerate industry. Um, so I think the other problem is going to be shipping will be competing in terms of the volumes of green fuels available against 
huge amounts of other in industries that are also going to be chasing these chasing these green fuels. So if you have um, green fuel uh, generation at one of the ports, for instance, it's going to be shipped off and it's going to be used for a whole number of other industries, not just not just shipping. So there's a lot of there's going to be a lot of competition for that uh, that supply, I believe. Mm -hmm. Mark, what do you think about that? Um, I, I agree, and and I would say disagree, but only slightly. I, I actually believe that there will be some dedicated routes um, which will be, have viable amounts of ammonia or hydrogen available to them for ships to use. And these will be areas where there's large scale export mm. rate investment going in for hydrogen ammonia projects and. And it will basically mean that the ships will need a very large tank to do a return voyage from the port. And, and that's that's where I see that we'll have by 2030 that sort of infrastructure. And it and that's and, and beyond that it will grow from that. But it again, it's going back to what Nick says, it's going to be constrained by there's a lot of competition for the fuel. And on the green side of it, there's, there's a huge amount of building we've got to do, a huge amount of infrastructure, and it's it's going to take a lot of time, and and well, reinforcing yourself, Walter. I mean, putting our heads in the sand and waiting for that is is not viable. You know, we we need to do something now, and we can do something that can actually help it. I think something also, Eduardo and, and, and team here that we haven't talked about, but I but I, and I think it's the one area that will end up being uh, being a, a weak link in this whole this whole transition. And that's the training of the crews to handle these fuels. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it, th these are different fuels that could be dangerous. There's a lot of these sort of things that we, we haven't even looked at. Now, that regime takes a long time. Training of your average, you know, Joe Mariner takes a long time. And there are jurisdictions that, that, that will weigh in on how they're going to be trained, what they need to know, how they need to know it. Then you have training institutions and how they how they come together. It again, this uh, the theme of uncertainty is is real, and we need certainty. What certainty do we have right now? We have certainty in liquid fuels. We're getting significant certainty more and more in LNG, which will help us transition. But the training regimes, the mariners have to be part of this discussion moving forward. Mm -hmm. Oh, just to uh, weigh in I on that. Say, sorry. sorry. <laughs> no, no, go ahead. Go ahead, man. I mean, there's, there's something that the, um, you know, these the clean, like SGMF and clean marine fuels are very big on is is the safety aspects of any of these fuels. And to, to get that in place is going to take a long time. And that flips to training as well. And and as soon as we're handling toxic fuels such as ammonia, I mean, we, it, it's very easy to generate bad press from a few experts. You know, this needs to be done carefully and thought through. Yep, well said. Mm -hmm. I, th I think that is an important, an important one. I mean, just the safety of the crew and the and the, uh, the ability to train them and to uh, to help them understand that the the complexity of the, those fuels. I don't want to to think what would be a cruise uh, ship with uh, with uh, ammonia as a fuel compared to other fuels. Uh, but apart from that, I, I have to remember people how bad we are at planning, uh, long-term planning. I mean, as I remember in 2000, uh, early 2000, 2003, I was working in the U.S. in a project to bring product, uh, to bring LNG into the U.S. from, from Qatar. I mean, that is as late as 2003. And uh, you can see where that project went. I mean, it's obviously we are really bad at looking at what will happen in 10 years time. So why not? applying solutions today uh, with the technology we have right. today and we'll think about what will happen in the in the future uh, when when it comes so but uh, we are running out of time uh, let me just uh, let's go through some of the questions that people are asking quickly uh, i will ask only one of us to answer each question uh, so i will bring uh, the first one up so if anyone wants to talk uh, to discuss what our or any comment on Rajnish, uh, sorry, I hope I pronounced it well. He's saying, with so much discussion happening on ammonia, replacing LNG as fuel in a few years, it's getting difficult to convince banks to finance LNG banking facilities. The World Bank's uh, World Bank report makes the situation even worse. Anyone? 
I'll go. Um, go ahead, Nick. I think the the difficult thing with with LNG bunkering is that it it helps with some of the the UN Sustainable Development Goals, so it is going to be aligned with um, some of the investors um, SDGs. So in that case, it, it, it's more about how you tell how you tell the story, um, and then also how the uh, the actual the fuel itself, the LNG itself, is actually sourced. If it's sourced responsibly and it's sourced from uh, a more modern facility, and secondly, if it can be sourced from a facility that utilizes carbon capture, um, CCS technologies, um, you can actually utilize. Uh, you can actually have a seventy percent reduction on your um, shipping operation versus two thousand and eight levels. Um, so seventy percent reduction now especially if you're looking at a 20 year timeline out to 2050, that's actually, that's still very, very significant. And it should be a less risky investment in that you're not investing in a technology that is that is yet to be developed. You're not investing in a moonshot. So if you're looking for a, a regular internal rate of return in a technology that you can say, look, look, this has been developed, it's at, it's at a technology index level 10, like we know what we're doing. The risk is much, much reduced, okay, it doesn't have the highest score on the SDG goals element. However, it'll score a seven in those and it will be scoring a 10 across the board and everything else. It, it's, up to, it's up to the investment fund, but you're, you're right. It's a difficult, it's a difficult sales process, um, but we're still going to need these, these fuels going forwards. Um, I think one of, the more, one of the more difficult things will be essentially accrediting carbon and um, running the correct logistic models and so on to ascertain where your emissions have come from when you look at the full scope one, two, and three emissions. That's going to be a harder, a harder challenge, to be honest. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. So, uh, I, 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 so I'm just going to say that we, um, we have noticed some banks exiting the uh, in, interest in, in funding this area, um, but then others are coming in with a more holistic view. Of, it is a transition fuel. It, it will help us get to where we want to be. I mean, um, they're not, you know, they, they're not just trying to make money. They acknowledge it, it reduces emissions and it will help us get to our end goal. So, I mean, not all banks are polarised from what we've seen on, on the fact if you're using LNG and you must be going straight to ammonia. Um, I mean, many of them recognise if we went straight to ammonia like that, they'd probably lose some money in, 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 unless it was an extremely long-term play, which may outlive some of these assets. The the following question is asking is mentioning classification societies such as DND have been promote, promoting LNG as bunker fuels since mid 2000s. Unfortunately, the uptake by vessels was not many them uh, till last five years. A lot has to do with infrastructure infrastructure investments by ports. It was a chicken and egg situation then. Is more or less what we've been discussing uh, and, and until now. Um, any comments on this one, or I go for the final question from the audience? Um, Let me jump. To... Sorry, go <laughs> no, it, it, it's. I mean, it's it's the problem is it's relying on industry collaboration where ship owners, LNG suppliers, regulators, everyone needs to get together and you know because no one company is is going to be able to do this, and it and it has been challenging. And it will not be exactly the same for the transition for the green fields as well. So, look, we're, LNG is paving that way. It is moving. The uptake is happening. Um, it didn't happen as quickly as, as people would have liked. Um, you know, that's you know, it's, it's just the nature of these things. But there is progress being made. Mm -hmm. I think, though, uh, this is a really, really good point for, and this is great advocacy for intergovernmental policy in that we only really saw a change in shipping fuel to LNG once the IMO put their um, edicts in place. Prior to that, as you said, there was very little uptake to LNG. The economic case, even though it made sense in some cases, was not was not enough to make that transition. So the the the, the sort of the IMO's intervention really did drive um, drive that uptake. Yeah, I'll final up uh, the final comment on this. Uh I believe that the that the chicken and egg is real. Governments have to support what we're trying to achieve. I think when you look at governments being supported by the financial institutions and 
with rolling out the whole ESG dialogue, that will make the difference. And to your point, I think, and to your point, Nick, that people have to, to, to want to do this. Industry has to want to do this. And governments have to want to do this. Well, governments are the people of their countries and of their and their, and their electors, electorate. And I think this is where it will make a difference. You are absolutely correct that we had, we had no uptake on this or very little before we knew it was coming, but before the, the 2020, uh, you know, the January 2020 sulfur uh, cap reduction requirement. And I think that is just an example of what we can, where we can go forward and move into this direction on a, on a, on a timeline, a measured timeline that can, Incorporate all of these things we've been talking about, the financing, the governments, all of this can pull together to make this happen in a measured way, sustainable way, and a financially viable way. Okay, great. Uh, one final comment from Gerardo. He's saying the next time we should bring up uh, the, the authors of the of the report. That would be great. So maybe we'll have okay. to organize more uh, more uh, panels like this one, and um, and invite all the parties involved to discuss the the options. And maybe they can they can challenge our 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 comments and our opinions. Well, yeah, so. We 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 agree with their end game of of, of the green fuels, which just the. Um, we have a very interesting journey ahead of us and there's many routes we can go and we just have a feeling that they they highlighted one path when there may be other more sustainable ones that we could follow yeah and with this and um with the thank you from uh alain um alain, thank thank you and all the audience uh, thank you to the four panelists um and thank you myself but anyway thank you thank you uh, all three of you and uh, and thank you everybody for being here it will finish uh, uh, the, the, this broadcast uh, right now, but we we will try to do more in the future because it brings a lot of, a lot of uh, attention, a lot of uh, people interested in the subject. So thank you very much. Any final comment, anyone, or we'll close the broadcast. Any comments? No, just thank you very much, Eduardo. Brilliant facilitator. And um, look forward to seeing you next time, hopefully with a representative from the World Bank. So let's see how they go. Thank you, Eduardo. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night.